Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Tumblr, Pinterest. These are all digital horcruxes that we use to store pieces of ourselves, making up our online identity, who we are. And how do we protect this valuable information that's so vital to our existence? Really? Are you kidding me? By the end of this video, you're gonna see how easy it is to crack simple passwords like these. All computer programs and websites that require a password to log in store those credentials in some type of database. And I'm sure you've heard or read about some big online companies whose user databases have been hacked or stolen and innocent people's passwords revealed. How does this happen? Well, it's through a hacking process known as SQL injection, where hackers can exploit flaws in coding designs to gain access to a database. But we'll cover SQL injection another time. To add a bit more security, passwords aren't stored in a database as is or in plain text. Instead, most programs now use some type of encryption method to convert the password to some type of illegible gibberish, also known as a hash, before storing it. So even if someone breaks into the database, they won't immediately have your password. All they'll have is gibberish. Some of the most popular types of hashing algorithms are NTLM, which is used by Windows, MD5, and SHA1. To see a couple of these in action, you can visit this website and then just enter in a string to see what each algorithm converts it to. But as I'm about to show you, even these hashes are hackable. If you're able to get your hands on a password hash through SQL injection or otherwise, then you can use special software to reverse the encryption and find the password. One of the more popular types of password cracking programs is Kane Enable, which you can download from here. Once it's installed and launched, you'll see tons of different hacking tools. But the one we're going to focus on is under the Cracker tab, which is used for cracking passwords. On the left, you'll see a list of different types of hashing algorithms. Let's select NTLM hashes, for example, which is what Windows uses to encrypt passwords. To import hashed passwords, click on the plus sign and select the first option to import hashes from all the users on your current computer. Otherwise, you can import hashes from a text file or a database file, and then click Next. A list of all the accounts on the system will pop up, and our area of interest will be the NT password column. If it says empty, that means there isn't a password on the account. If it's blank, then it has a password. So right-click on the account that you wish to crack, and it will give you different cracking options. Dictionary, brute force, and cryptanalysis attacks. A dictionary attack reads from a list of preset passwords to try. If you go to this website, you can download a list of the 10,000 most commonly used passwords. And then select the dictionary attack in Kane Enable, choose NTLM hashes, and then right click in the dictionary box to add this file to your list. When you click start, the program will cycle through the list of passwords and convert them to the NTLM hash to see if it matches the hash in the database. If it finds a match, it will then display what the password is. The speed at which this process completes depends on the speed of your computer. The dictionary attack is the fastest way to crack a password, but only if it's in the list. If it's not, the next fastest way is through a method called brute force. Brute force is essentially a method of trying all possible combinations of letters, numbers, and or symbols and then hashing them until it finds a matching combination. This is where the complexity of your password really pays off. On average, more than half the passwords on the internet are lowercase letters and six characters in length. On my i7 laptop with 16 gigabytes of RAM, that only takes 30 seconds to crack. So if that's you and someone breaks into LinkedIn or Twitter's databases, you're screwed. To use brute force and cane enable, right click on the user, select brute force, and then select NTLM hashes, and it will bring up a new window with criteria regarding the password complexity. As you can see, adding just one number to your password raises the crack time to four minutes. Adding a number in uppercase letters takes more than an hour. 
then throwing a cymbal into the mix bumps it up to about five hours. Still, this is a very short amount of time when it comes to your security. But if you include all those characters and then increase the length of your password to say 10, the time to crack it increases exponentially. In this case, it'll take about 18,000 years. Now that's more like it. Brute force is the most common means of password cracking. But there's a third option called cryptanalysis, which is simply the study of cryptography to see if it can be breached. This method of cryptanalysis uses what's called rainbow tables. Without getting overly complicated, a rainbow table can be a long string of millions of hashes. Then the rainbow table will take a smaller pattern within the original hash, known as a reduction function, and search for that instead of searching for the entire hash. The benefit to this is that it can be a lot faster, assuming you have enough memory to store all the hashing functions. And you can find rainbow tables to use by searching for them on Google. So with that, you now have three different options to try and crack other hashing algorithms. What are your thoughts on password cracking? Is it evil? Can it be useful? Let me know what you think in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this tutorial, please consider subscribing by clicking the subscribe button. Or you can just visit my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash gigafy. Alright, that's it for this tutorial. Until next time, hack some fun into your weekend.